Welcome to BizHack Live, our weekly series on digital marketing for small businesses. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the host of BizHack Live and the founder and CEO of BizHack Academy. We are a digital marketing training academy uh, dedicated to making it easier for small businesses to grow. Uh, we empower small businesses with a simpler way to grow. And uh, today I'm excited to welcome Ben Holland, who's going to be talking about Google Analytics, starting with some of the beginner strategies that small businesses can implement, and then transitioning into some more advanced techniques that you can use to leverage analytics and specifically the analytics from Google Analytics for your business. Um, we are right now in the process of building out season four of BizHack Live, which will start in the fall. And we're asking folks to please fill out this survey to tell us what you want from that. Uh, Lilia will put it in the chat. Um, and you know, this has been a, a free community service that we've done since the start of COVID. Uh, we are right now on to our 55th live webinar in a little bit over a year and a half. Um, and we really, we know the world is changing, your businesses are evolving, and we want to make sure that BizHack Live is evolving with you. So please take a moment and fill out the survey. You'll be eligible to win a $50 Amazon gift card as a thank you for taking the time. It's a, it's a five-minute survey. It'll be really fast. Uh, if you can do it right now while we're on the call. Uh, on this webinar, that'd be great. Um, I wanted to acknowledge our partners, uh, the South Florida uh, Interactive Marketing Association, the American Marketing Association, Creation Station in Fort Lauderdale, CIC in Miami, and the 10,000 Small Business Program, uh, of which I'm both an instructor and an alumnus. Um, and I wanted to talk just very quickly, uh, when people ask, well, what is BizHack about? What do you guys do? What we've done is we empower businesses with a simpler way to grow. And we have a model for how to do that called the lead building system. It includes a foundation, six pillars, and nine steps. And the foundation uh, of digital marketing for us is your business story. But one of those pillars is your campaign objective. And measuring whether you've achieved your campaign objective is what analytics is all about. So today is really a deep dive into the first pillar. And we have a program, a seven week program where we work with business owners, running them through this lead building system, all of the six pillars, the foundation, and then a step-by-step -step process for implementing that for their business. We encourage you all to apply. We also want you to ask questions. Um, you'll see at the bottom, there's a little Q&A option and we would love for you to put your questions in there. We'll be sharing uh, the slides and a link to the recording for those of you guys uh, who are here today. So thank you for coming. You don't need to take crazy notes. We'll be sharing that with you. And then we post the recordings uh, on our YouTube page. So without further ado, I want to welcome the amazing Ben Holland from Q Financial and Scorpion Sweepers. One of the things I, I love about Ben um, is that he is the, a business owner himself and he runs Scorpion Sweepers which is a pest control company. Uh, and he's leveraged the data from Google Analytics to run the business more effectively and to allow him uh, also to do other things with his time, which is kind of uh, an entrepreneur's dream. So uh, Ben, if you get a chance, I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, um, I think it's just so cool that you run a pest control company. We work with a lot of home service companies and pest control companies. And I just think that that's uh, awesome. He's also been 15 years uh, involved in entrepreneurship and marketing. He's led teams, he's won marketing awards, and he's been very active with the American Marketing Association in Phoenix, where he's based, uh, as well as other marketing boards. So Ben, it's uh, great to have you here. Thank you so much for giving your time uh, to the BizHack community. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Uh, and I want to thank you, everybody at BizHack, for putting this on and uh, being so easy to work with. I'm really looking forward to it. And thanks for everybody taking a little bit of the time of the day uh, to listen to me and learn about what I have to say. So let me uh, share my screen real quickly. All right. Can everybody see that? Perfect. Yes. All right. 
move this guy over here and then present mode. All right, well, that's what we're all here for, Google Analytics. So a little bit about me. I work for a company called Signature Brand Factory. Um, so we're a full service agency based in Connecticut. So if you have any needs with marketing, please give me a holler and uh, we can work something out. I also serve as a marketing director for a company called Influence Group. Um, Signature Brand Factory, full service. So again, if you have an RFP coming up, you need a little bit uh, assistance with marketing, or you just have a question, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn or with my email, bennettsigbrand.com. All right, so today with Google Analytics, first I'm going to talk a little bit about analytics. I'm going to show you how to optimize your account in the back end in the settings section. I'm going to show you a, a pretty common problem. You come in and you see a spike happen with your traffic. You just get a ton of traffic. So I'm going to talk about solving that spike and figuring out what is the best way to um, go at that and see where the spike came from. I'm going to briefly talk about using Google Data Studio to report. And then I'm going to go through what I like to call a lightning round, where I just highlight some useful tools I want everybody to be aware about. So the first thing is about Google Analytics. So Google Analytics is this big pro, uh, platform with a ton of buttons that can be super confusing. So the first place you want to go besides attending this event is Google Analytics Academy. They have different courses for beginners all the way up to advanced, and it's going to teach you everything you need to know about Google Analytics. There's also an IQ certification you can take that's a separate test from this um, that you can put into your LinkedIn. Each of these will give you a little certificate you can also put in your LinkedIn or your resume. So if you're you know, intrigued about what you have to hear today, definitely check out Analytics Academy to find out more. Uh, I will be referencing a blog post I wrote about four or five years ago uh, at, from a website, zionandzion.com. If you guys want to go there, the URL is right here. A lot of the how-tos to do what I'm talking about, like setting up filters, setting up goals, all the step-by-step -step and screenshots are going to be found on this blog post. So if you want to reference this when you're trying to implement it yourself, please do. You can also see in the top right-hand corner, I have some social icons along with the hashtag SIGBRAND. If you ever want to take a screenshot or a picture and put this up on social media, please use the hashtag SIGBRAND. So uh, Google Analytics, if you don't know what it is, is a great tool. You put it onto your website and allows you to see where users are going on your website, where they've come from, and what they're doing on your website. So how you're making money, how you're converting these users. It's a really great tool to learn about how people interact with your website and to make business decisions based off the interactivity with your website. There is a new platform of Google Analytics that just was launched in October called Google Analytics 4. We are not talking about this. Almost everybody has what's called Universal Analytics. So if you don't know what you have, you probably have Universal Analytics. If you want to know about the differences between the two platforms, there's a great link right there that you can click and see what the differences are. Google Analytics 4 is kind of being built for this cookie-less future that we're getting into. So it might be a good idea to run them seamlessly at the same time. All right. So the first thing you're going to do when you get into Google Analytics is you're going to see this interface. And man, there's just a lot going on here. There's graphs, there's data, there's buttons. It's, it's just a mess. So what I want to do is break down this left-hand navigation, because that's how you're going to get through the entire platform. The first two sections, home and customization, are really all about reporting. Now, what I like to use for reporting is Google Data Studio. It's a free tool that you can connect analytics data right into, and you can build really cool custom dashboards, and you can have them automatically sent out to you weekly, monthly, daily, however the frequency you would like. So I really like to port that data out, but you can also build custom reports within analytics and that's in the customization section and the home gives you a quick overview. Uh, the next section is the real time section. So that's what's happening right now. And what I think is really cool about the real time section is it tracks the events. So you can put little things called events on buttons or anything else that you would click on Google or on your website. Once they click it, it'll fire off in Google Analytics and the real time will see it happening right then. So I like to pair the real time section with uh, one of the views I'm gonna show you how to make in the future called the testing view, where I only allow my IP address in so I can see what I'm doing on the website and if what I've implemented is actually working. That's what I really like the real time for. Other than that, I don't really see a big use case for it, unless you wanna put it up on a monitor or something in your marketing department, because it's kind of cool to see people popping on and off of the website and where they're from and what pages they're on. The next section I wanna talk about is the audience section. Now this is who is, uh, your user, how old are they, what's their gender, you know, where are they from, what kind of devices they're, they're using. 
The next section is the acquisition section. That's where are they coming from? What website did they come from? Was it an organic search? Did they type the URL in directly? Did they come from social media? Behavior is what did they do on your website? What pages did they go on? Did they click on any buttons? Conversion, this is the stuff you kind of have to set up. This is going to give you your sales and your goals and like your conversion rates. And then at the end of the talk, we're going to talk about the admin section and how to set all this stuff up so your Google Analytics is running smoothly and you have all really great clean data to make business decisions off of. Please feel free to ask any questions at any time. I do have the Q&A section up here. So if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to throw it in there and I'll answer it for you. So the first section I want to talk about is the audience section. Here, you're going to be able to talk about, learn about their location, age, gender, the language, the affinity categories, how frequently they visit your website, the types of device they're on, the browsers, and then if they're going from like their tablet, tablet to their phone or to their computer, and they're going across multiple devices. Something I want to highlight here is affinity categories. So affinity categories are kind of like interest groups that the users are having. So do I like sneakers? Am I a foodie? Do I like to travel? That's what an affinity category is. And they get that data from the double click network. Now, the percentages of your users that fall within any affinity category is pretty low. The most I've seen is like 7%. So you would think this would be a great place to start with your persona based marketing. But I I just don't think there's enough data there. And you'll see that with a lot of different things with Google Analytics is I don't trust the data, but I trust the trends. So affinity categories of all of a sudden I see more tourists coming to my site. I'm going to be really interested in that, but I'm not going to take a lot of solace in the data of 7% of the users that come to the website. So here's what the audience overview section looks like. And here's the spike we're going to get into a little bit later. But these first three metrics here, users, new users, and sessions, are all really how good are you at getting people to your website? The next five metrics is how good are you at keeping them on your website? You know, how many sessions do they have per user? That's how many times are they coming back to the website? Page views is how many different pages they saw on your website. Pages per session. So that's how many times each time they come, how many different pages they viewed. The average duration is how long they're on your website for a session. And then the bounce rate is uh, when they've come to one page on your website, not interacted with it and left. Now, a lot of people have confusion about bounce rate. I'm gonna get into that a little bit later when I compare it to something I think is more important, which is exit rate. But I'll define a bounce for you right now because a lot of people have this question is, a bounce is when somebody comes to your website, they could be on it for one second, 30 minutes, but if they don't go to another page on your website or interact with an event you've done, they're going to show up as a bounce. So somebody could be on your website for, you know, 20 minutes, get everything they need from it and leave. And that's not really a bad negative experience, but a lot of people have a negative connotation to bounces. So I don't think if you have a good page that answers the question correctly, a bounce is that bad. All right. The next section I want to highlight in the audience um, part is the demographic section. Now you do have to turn this on in the back end, and I'll show you how to do that a little bit later, but this is where you can get your age and your gender data. Now this is where I really like to start when I'm doing personas for my marketing is this is straight from the horse's mouth. This is who is engaging with your website, with your brand, you know, how old they are and what gender they are. So this is kind of where I start when I do persona based marketing. Next is the locations. I love this map. I love putting this map in my reporting to the C-suite or whoever my boss is because it can convey exactly what your users are doing and where they're coming from so quickly. Somebody sees this chart and they get it immediately. I pulled this instance from the AMA Phoenix and you can see we get a lot of traffic from the Phoenix area. So that's really good to know. But if we got a lot of traffic from New York or something, we may wanna change our, our um, customer service hours to be able to uh, help out all those users in New York. We might want to open up a little bit earlier if people are calling in. So that's what I really like about this graph. You can quickly and easily see where people are coming from and understand how you may need to serve different users in different locations differently. Next is the mobile section. So this is going to tell you if they're coming in on a desktop, on a mobile phone, or on a tablet. Now, I think this is really, really important, especially with how the algorithm is changing for Google. They now have two indexes. They have a mobile index and a desktop index. So if somebody's on their phone, they're going to get results from this mobile index. If they're on their computer, they're getting results from their desktop. It used to be all desktop. So how your mobile experience was didn't really matter that much, but that has changed. So if you're seeing a lot more desktop traffic than mobile, maybe you need to optimize your site a little bit for mobile, or maybe you have more business to business business. Yeah, um, there's a lot of different reasons why users would use different devices. That's some insights you can see if you're getting a lot of mobile traffic and it drops down, especially with the update that's happening this month. Maybe your mobile friendliness isn't so great. 
Now, feel free to ask any questions. The next section I'm gonna talk about is the acquisition section. <clears throat> now, this is gonna talk about the different types of traffic that you have on your website. Organic traffic <clears throat> is if they came from a search engine, advertising traffic, you know, display or SEM. Referral is when somebody has a link to your website from another site and they click it. Social traffic, you know, Facebook, Twitter. Search terms is what people are typing into Google. That's a section I'm gonna dive into a little bit. And then also campaign results. So when you get into the acquisition section, you're going to see how you, all of your traffic is broken down between these default channel groupings. Now, what you really want to see here is high organic traffic and high direct traffic, because that's all free stuff. You don't really have to earn that. Stuff like social, email, or paid, you're putting in time and effort and money in some instances to gain that traffic. So I like to see a lot of organic traffic and a lot of direct traffic. If you need an increase in some of those channels, uh, some ways to increase organic traffic is go do some link building, write some really good articles and try to get them picked up by other sites. Direct traffic would be building your brand awareness. If you need more social traffic, post up on social. Um, email traffic, send out an email. And then refer, referral traffic, a good way to boost that is with press releases. Now, sometimes Google doesn't know where the traffic's coming from. So they'll just put it in a bucket called other. And they're just like, we don't really know, but we know you did get this traffic. And that's what that is. Now, I really, really like this section. This is the Search Console section. So if you haven't heard of Google Search Console, if you have a website, you should have Google Search Console set up. It tells you a lot of great information and diagnostics about your website, and they'll alert you if something's wrong with your website. So if you have a website, you should set it up. And this is one of the features that Google Search Console has that you can port into Google Analytics. And it's the Search Terms Report. So you can see exactly what people are typing into Google to get to your website. It shows you the... Uh, amount of clicks people are clicking. So they type it in and click it to your website. Shows you your impressions. So maybe they don't click it, but you show up in the search. It'll um, be shown here. It has your click-through rate and also your average position, your ranking for that specific term. So a lot of people are out there paying for Ahrefs, SEMrush, these tools to track keywords, but you can get it for free in Google Analytics or in Google Search Console, or you can even build something in Data Studio using this data. So this is a really hidden tidbit that I don't think a lot of people know about, but it's free keyword research for your website. If you don't see this turn on, I'm gonna teach you how to turn this on in the admin section. Now, the next thing is I wanna talk about is the campaign section here. So I wanna do a little bit of a hypothetical with you. Let's say you're uh, doing a new brand launch, a new brand campaign, and you're doing some email marketing, you're doing social media marketing, maybe you did some press releases, you got a new blog post, you know, you're really blowing it out of the water with an omni-channel campaign, but you wanna know how each instance of the, uh, each factor of your campaign is doing. So how is social doing compared to email marketing? Well, you can use these things called you, uh, UTM variables in your URL, they're called urchin tracking method codes. And you put it in there, you can type in medium source or campaign, and then Google Analytics sees those points in your URL, and then they cut it up and put it into this campaigns report. So you can see how your email is faring up against your social media or against your advertisement for the same campaign. It's a really great tool. If you wanna learn more about urchin tracking method and building these URLs, this is a really great tool to uh, create those URLs for yourself for free and super easy. Now I'm gonna let you take a screenshot of that if you want and take a sip of my tea. Perfect, so the next section we're getting into is the behavior section. Here you can learn about the site flow, page specific data, your site speed. Site search here is a little bit different. This is what people are actually searching for on your website, not what they're searching for on Google. You can learn about the events that you implement on your website. And if you're doing any experiments with like Google Optimize, you can see that data here. So this, this screen here is a behavior flow and man, is it beautiful, but I do not get much from this. This is super confusing and whenever I have it in meetings, <coughs> Bless me, excuse me. Whenever I've had used this in meetings and presented it to the C-suite, it just makes a lot more questions happen than answers. It's pretty, it shows you fall off reporting, but people can't digest it very quickly. So I am not a fan of this report. I did find one use case where this was beneficial. I was working on Goodwill of uh, Central Arizona and I found people are going from the homepage to the search page and the homepage and the search page. And it was kind of a loop and it was going on for like the seventh interaction. And I had no idea what was going on. So I went to the website and I figured out that when you are on a mobile device, 
the search didn't work. You would just go there and it just, it just wouldn't work. So people are going back to the homepage and trying to search again and again, and then they would just leave the website. That's the only time this has really helped me out when I saw somebody get in, in a loop onto the website. Other than that, it's kind of confusing. If you're looking for navigation summaries or navigation traffic on your website, I prefer this much more. It's in the all pages report. It's up here. It's kind of hard to find. It's this navigation summary tab. But if you're on a specific page, it'll tell you where they were before and where they went after. And I think this is a lot easier to understand and uh, better to present than that other chart. The next page I'm on all the time, I love this screen in Google Analytics, is the all pages report and site content. And this is going to be each page on your website, how many times people have viewed it, how many unique people have viewed it, because people can view a page more than once, the average time on that page. Entrances is when they land onto that page. So they don't go on the home page and end up there. They actually landed on that specific page. So that's a really good indicator of good SEO. If you have a lot of your blog pages with a ton of entrances, that means you're getting people to your website through other means than your home page, which is what you're really looking for. You can see the bounce rate of individual pages and the exit rate. And now I'm going to dive into the difference between bounce rates and exits. So all bounces are exits, but not all exits are bounces. So a bounce rate is if you're on one page and then you leave. An exit, I could be on 10, 15, 100 pages on your website, but it's the last page I'm on when I leave. So what I really like looking at is the exit rate of, site, of pages that shouldn't have a high exit, right? right? Your homepage shouldn't have a high exit rate. Your blog pages shouldn't have a high exit rate. Maybe your contact us page does. Maybe you think your page does. But I like to go here and see, hmm, is the exit a little bit higher on this page than it should be? And if it is, I'm going to work on inter, uh, you know, linking to other pages on the website, maybe having a better call to action, figuring out what I can do with that page to keep people stuck on it. So site search, this is a really great tool. Um, this is where I go for content ideas. So if people are on your website and they're typing something into the magnifying glass on your specific website, that means they want this content. So if you're seeing somebody type that in there, you should write about it because they're looking for it. It's a need from that user on your website. Now I wanna go into a bit of a use case here uh, with the site search, because I think it's a pretty fun story. I used to work for this aquarium in Scottsdale, Odyssey Aquarium, fifth biggest aquarium in the United States. If you're there, please visit it. Uh, but we were right next to a place called Dolphin Aris. It was adjacent 30 feet away, but it was a completely company, a different company. And we were having a problem where our users would come to the aquarium or they come to our website and they wanted to see the dolphins or they would get through the aquarium and they'd be upset because they didn't get to see the dolphins. Um, so we had a bit of an issue. And I noticed in that search terms report that the top six terms, over 30% of our searches contained the word dolphin. Like people wanted to know what was up with the dolphins. And it was kind of a touchy subject because of PETA and all. So we wanted to kind of avoid the dolphins altogether as the aquarium. But when we saw some of the people searching for it, we put this up in the search results. If you typed in DOL, this would pop up. You may be looking for something completely different. We're not affiliated with Dolphin Aris. Um, it's a different entity right next door. If you'd like to go and see the dolphins, please click this. And we added some of those UTM tracking parameters to that link, and we were able to make this a referral income source. And this worked out so well, we actually put a booth in the aquarium to sell tickets to Dolphin Aris. So this is how we were able to use Google Analytics to see a need users were having and then monetize it. Now events, I'm not gonna dive too, too much in events, but basically anything that somebody can click on, you can add an event onto, and then you can track that throughout the website. A lot of people create goals based on events. I'm gonna talk about it a little bit later when I get into the admin section. All right. So this is uh, the conversion section. This is really where the money is at. Where this is where we're talking about the goals we have to set up in the admin, the funnels that we have from these goals. If you have e-commerce set up, your product sales, and then also attribution, which is really important. So this is the first screen you're gonna see when you get into the goals section. You're gonna see the number of completions. You're gonna see if you've assigned a value to that goal, which you do when you create the goal. You can see the amount of money you've uh, earned from it. Oops. You can see your conversion rate. You can see how many people have fallen out of your funnels. That's what the abandonment rate is. And then you can see where they've been completed here. So this is a really great screen. Right here, this next screen, um, this right here, this next screen, if you're eating your lunch or if you're sending an email, I really want you to pause because this is what I think is the most important feature in analytics that people don't know about is this multi-channel funnel section. <clears throat> so a lot of times you have a hard time um, attributing your marketing dollars or your campaigns, especially with display advertising. 
Um, now there's a there's first click and last click attribution. So that's the two common models a lot of people use in marketing. First click is, hey, it's the first time I interacted with your brand, I'm giving it all of the credit. The last click is like, oh, I clicked this ad and then I bought. So this ad is gonna get all the credit. But there's so many touch points in between that you don't see that don't get the credit. Now, this is a really great section of analytics that shows you all of the touch points you've had with a user throughout the web. So you can give that credit across the entire campaign as opposed to giving it to your first or last credit. So if you're not getting the value you are, out of, uh, you think you should be getting out of a certain channel, this is a great place to hop into and then see where it is in the conversion cycle and then highlight that because maybe it's not getting the credit it deserves, but it's within the cycle. Um, E-commerce is also within this conversion section. Uh, here's a really great article to learn all about it. It's easy to turn on e-commerce. Uh, e you just have to click a button in the back end. But if you want to turn on enhanced e-commerce, I highly encourage you to read this article. It talks about implementing. You might need to get somebody to help you out with that. All right, now I'm going to get into the settings of Google Analytics and how to get it humming and giving you really great data. So in the admin section, you're gonna see user management, you're gonna see filters, goals, alerts, tracking codes, and all of the other settings. And what's really important is getting everything in the right place. You want everything in order and set up correctly. Um, so you get in here and the first thing you see is like, wow, there are a lot of buttons in here. And some of them are the same. It's like, why are there user management all across? Like, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So the first thing I want you to know is they're cascading. So anything you do for the account, Go, uh, also is applied to property and view. But if you do it for view, it's not gonna apply it for account. So long story short, if you fire somebody, you wanna remove them from the account level as opposed to the view level. And you wanna look at these three levels this way. The account level is about your business <clears throat> and your business may have multiple websites or properties. And then, then these <clears throat> websites may have different views or segments. So um, what I like to do, give me one moment. What I like to do is create a bunch of different segments for each website and different views. One of the views I like to have is an unfiltered view that's untouched, that is just the raw data. So I know if something goes wrong with my views, I have all the raw data there. Kind of a fallback plan. I like to create a main view that has all of my filters, all of my goals, everything set up properly. And it's where I really go to make my business, my database decisions. I like to have a testing view that only allows my IP address. So I know I'm the only one on the website that's interacting with Google Analytics in that specific view. So I can see exactly what I'm doing when I'm trying to implement stuff. And then if you're getting any sampling through your Google Analytics, when you get over 250,000 sessions over a specific time frame, you'll get sampling. So it's a good problem to have. And if you're getting it, you can create segments like my organic traffic segment or my advertising, advertising segment to avoid the sampling. Next, we'll get into the account settings. So the pro tip with account settings is uh, check everything. Just turn it all on because most of the stuff is there to help you. This benchmarking feature is really cool. I like to turn it on because it compares your company in your vertical with other companies in your vertical, your location, and of your size. So you can see if you're getting as much organic traffic as your competitors. Now, it doesn't list the competitors, but it shows you the benchmark. And that's a really cool tool that I like a lot that is uh, found right here. Next in the property settings, I can't tell you how many times I've seen this default URL messed up. It doesn't have, a, they put HTTP in it or they take HTTP out when it should be in there. There's a www when there isn't. So the pro tip here is just go to the website, make sure you have what shows up in the location bar when you go to the homepage showing up there. This industry category is what you wanted to find to work with that benchmarking feature I just told you. This advanced setting here to allow manual tagging UTM values. Remember how I told you how to set up those cool campaign-based URLs? If you wanna do that for your AdWords advertising, you have to check this box. It's only for ads, Google ads, because they use something called GCLID. So if you wanna do it your way, instead of using GCLID, you can click that. Either way is cool, it doesn't really matter. This is where you're gonna turn on enhanced link attribution. So they kind of have some heat mapping features in Google Analytics that I didn't go over, but if you wanted to see that, you would turn that on. This is also where we, you would add search console. So when you wanna see your search terms that people are typing into Google, this is how you connect that. And right here is how you turn on the demographic information. So gender and age, if you turn that on, and then in the next screen, I'll turn you show you what else you have to turn on. 
right here in the data collection section. Turn that on. That's just saying you updated your privacy policy to let people know you were tracking this. Hit save, and now you will get that age and gender information. Here at the bottom is where you can link all of your products. So if you're using AdSense, Google Ads, Google Search Console, any product you're using that can interface with Google Analytics, this is where you would connect it. And I recommend connecting as much as you possibly can. Now we're getting into the view settings. The view settings, so exclude query parameters. So this is really interesting. If you see that you're getting the same page with, with a bunch of different listings in your like all pages report because of um, query parameters at the end, like there could be a session ID or something that comes in with a variable number every single time. So you have the same URL, but a bunch of different instances of it because of some parameter. If you stick that parameter in here, it'll eliminate that and really clean up that data. Bot filtering, I don't know why it's not checked on automatically, but it should be. Now it doesn't get all of the bots, but it gets most of the bots. The next thing you wanna turn on is the site search setting. That's how you figure out what people are typing and looking for on your website. Remember the dolphin example. And if you are having site search on your website, you would wanna put what shows up after the search in the URL. Let's say they type it in and it's odysseyaquarium.com slash S equals dolphins. That S equals is a parameter that you want stripped out. And that's what you would put in there. And that's why you check that box. Here is where you would set up all of your goals. There are four types of goals. There's pages per uh, pages or screens per session. There's a duration, there's destination and event. Now I almost always do event-based goals. There's only one instance where I would do something different and that would be a destination-based goal. And that's if I wanted a funnel. I can only get funnels you know, and fall off reports if I use a destination-based goal. So let me explain the, uh, an instance where you might wanna use an event or a destination-based goal. Let's say you have a form on your website and you fill it out and you click a submit button. Now, the way I could track this is with either one. I could have myself click it and then it fires off an event and then that's gonna make my goal trigger because I fired off the event. Or I could click it and go to like a thank you page and that thank you page is the destination that I would have firing to set off my destination based goal. Now, the only reason in my opinion that you'd want that destination based goal is if you had a path to that, that thank you page that you wanted to know if people were falling off of so you could measure that. And that's pretty much the only time you would use that. I like events and I like using event-based goals. Next is filters. Uh, the main thing about filters is getting all of your data uniform. Um, so lower casing everything. If somebody types it in N-I-K-E with a capital N or N-I-K-E with a lowercase N on Nike.com, it's gonna be two different data points. <clears throat> so you really want them to be the same in uniform. So you don't have to look at two data sets to make a decision. So I like to lowercase everything. If you need to search and replace something, you can do it here. Um, if you wanna learn more about doing all of this stuff, make sure to check out that article I have on Zion and Zion, it gives you the walkthrough to do all the settings. And here is the custom alerts. I really like custom alerts to save your skin. Sometimes you'll do a new push to the website and forget to put Google Analytics tracking code on there. And this is gonna let you know that it's missing. You can set up an alert that just shoots you an email says, hey, there was no data yesterday. It'll let you know, it'll save your skin. It'll let you know before your boss knows that the tracking code got taken off. Again here, I'll let you take a screenshot of this. This is the article that gives you all of the walkthroughs and all the how to's to do all of this. All right, events with Tag Manager. So I've been talking about events a whole lot and there's a lot to events and they can be kind of abstract. So this is a really great article to teach you everything you need to know about events. My preferred way of putting them on the website is through Tag Manager, which is another system. Now you may think it's difficult with analytics and Tag Manager and you gotta learn all this stuff. It really isn't, it's actually super intuitive. It's drag and drop, it's clicking. It's a lot of just learning what the system is. And then once you get it, it's really easy and breezy. So this is just a screenshot of how easy it is to implement an event with Tag Manager. So the next thing I wanna talk about is solving the spike. Let's say one day you come in and you have a really great problem to solve. Oh, I got a ton of traffic. Now me, I'm always wondering, why did I get this traffic? Is it true? I always think, man, it's gotta be a bot if I see a spike. So that's what I try to do. I try to come in and prove that it's not a bot. So the first thing I do is I look for annotations. Annotations are notes you can put into analytics. So anytime you do anything that impacts the traffic of a website, you should put an annotation. <clears throat> so let's say you made a new page on the website, put in an annotation. Let's say you got a new link to the website, put in an annotation. You did a press release, put in an annotation. If there was a note in here right now, I'd know what happened with the spike, but there isn't. So I need to keep doing some research. 
The next thing I want to do is check the location. So this instance is for uh, American Marketing Association Phoenix. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I get a lot of traffic from Canada um, one night out of the blue uh, at the AMA Phoenix. So that's going to be my first uh, thought. Man, this is probably a bot from Canada. So I found the location. So the next thing I'm going to do is make a segment with that location. So I know these people are all from Canada. They're actually from Ontario. I have it set for just the date that I have the traffic in. So I've created a segment that is just these users that I feel may be a bot. Now I'm going to check the time. So we have a whole bunch of Canadians on a Phoenix Phoenix website in the middle of the night from two o'clock to five o'clock in the morning. Man, that doesn't seem right. It seems unnatural. It's probably a bot. Next thing I'm going to do is check the channel. So this is where I knew for sure. So I have a bunch of Canadians in the middle of the night coming to the website, typing in AMA Phoenix dot org directly in there um, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense and look they all went to one page and they all bounced so they were all on the site for no time one page at all it definitely was a bot um, so this is a little cheat sheet if you see a spike from a uh, specific channel this is kind of a cheat sheet of what the spike might be if you see a spike in direct traffic it's probably a bot or maybe you did some media like you did a, a commercial or something and people remember your your url if it's organic, it means you increased your brand awareness. So you might've also done a, a commercial or something. Uh, paid means you might've accidentally spent too much money on an account and um, it's irregularly high. Uh, and that's why you have a spike. Social, you know, you had something that went viral. Or what I see a lot is you do a paid social campaign, but you don't tag it properly. And that's why you get a spike in that channel. Email, you know, a popular email. And then if you have a spike in referral, it's usually something went viral or you did a press release. All right, so reporting with Data Studio. Um, data Studio is by far my favorite method to report the data in analytics and from your website. This is just a free template you can go on play with right now to kind of dip your toe into Data Studio. And uh, it's a free tool. Check it out. And this is how you can learn more about it. And it gives you a solid report right off the bat. So next, I'd like to talk about my lightning round, where I just talk about a few products that I feel like everybody should know about. <coughs> if you have a business, you should be set up on Google My Business. It helps with local SEO, and it's a good way to get your um, show up into Google Maps. Some local SEO tips is have your address and contact information in, uh, on every single page. I like it in the footer. Have a single page for each location. I see, oh, excuse me, I see this with a lot of pizza places where they'll have a locations page and all of them listed on one page. Whereas you should have a single page for each location. It's better optimized that way. Use schema microdata to optimize your website. Use local directories like Yelp and Google Maps to increase local links. And then utilize tools like Moz Local and Yex to be syndicated across the web. I love Google Search Console. It's a great tool. If you have a website, you should be set up on Google Search Console. This is a cool tool. If you're ever wondering if you set up things correctly with uh, on the tags of your website, so is your Facebook pixel right, your LinkedIn pixel right, this is uh, <clears throat> the Google Chrome Tag Assistant. So you put this in Chrome and it'll tell you if your tags are on correctly. This is a mobile friendly test that comes from Google. It's a great way to see if you're doing well on that mobile index I talked about earlier. Page speed insights, great way to find out if your site is fast. Six website tips. So just common SEO is have a good, fast website, have a good user experience, utilize HTTPS, uh, compress your images. I've seen so many websites with beautiful, gigantic file-sized images. If you just compress that, you can have all the beauty of it, but then it would be fast because it's compressed. I like using Google Tag Manager to implement my tags. And I um, always recommend uploading a sitemap to Google Search Console so Google knows what pages you want to have crawled. Google Ads is how you show up um, uh, when people do searches on Google uh, in their advertising. This is how you do that. Google Trends is a great way to see what terms may be searched for in, instead of others. So like sneakers versus shoes, you could compare that here. Google Voice, you can get a free phone number for your phone. And Google serve, uh, surveys, while not free, is a great way to start doing some market research. Here's Google Drive. Uh, it's a great place, a repository for your files. Google Forms, I love Google Forms because you can dump it into a Google Sheet and then using a tool like Zapier, you can automate all sorts of really great stuff for your business using Google Forms, Google Sheets, and Zapier. And that's probably my favorite tool out there right now is this, and that's like why I like to end on it. So please, if you have any questions, let me know. That was fabulous. You did a hundred slides in 40 minutes. You're like the micro machines guy, Jesus. <laughs> but the benefit, I mean, I, like 
each of those bullet points you could have like unpacked into so much. It's, it's really, um, this was like, um, sometimes I watch Netflix on 1.25 speed, uh, cause I want to get through it faster. That was fabulous. Um, you know, incredibly clear, um, really, really well done. Ben, I was saying very nice things about you and, and your presentation. I was wondering, do you have a test account that you could kind of walk us through just to give us a live demo if you're comfortable? If not, no worries. Uh, actually, um, I don't. Would I, I couldn't do something like that right now, unfortunately. Yeah, no worries at all. Um, alternatively, uh, you know, I would love to invite some of the participants on the call who have specific challenges or questions uh, to go ahead and talk with you about those. Um, is there any participant on the call right now? This is a great opportunity to get some um, expert coaching. If you wanted to go ahead and raise your hand, you'll see on the bottom, uh, there's a raise hand option. Um, and um, while we're doing that, uh, I'd actually love uh, one of our analytics folks, Stephanie Miller. Um, Steph, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you the ability to talk. We've been working uh, on a lot of this stuff uh, with BizHack itself. Um, and I would love for you uh, to talk a little bit about some of the takeaways that you got from this presentation while we're waiting for a volunteer uh, who has a question on, on how this applies. Yeah, absolutely. Um, first, I wanna just commend, I think the structure of the presentation was phenomenal. The fact that you yeah. were navigating the environment, uh, I think is one of the most critical components of software education. Um, and, you know, for us, I think the, the real thing is like as a small business, like you, you covered the gamut of a lot of these pieces and these are, this is a, it's a complex application, but if you had to advise a small business on the three most important things they need to do using Google analytics, what would those three most important, or maybe it's five, but what are the most important things a small business kind of getting started with data and analytics, what should they focus on first? Yeah, so I would see what content users are interacting with. Um, maybe they're looking at a product that you didn't know was so popular. So you can get an idea of trends and what users want from that and how they're interacting with your business. So I would do that. Um, then location, I would see where my users are coming from. So you can make sure you're open at the right times. Uh, and then how are they accessing your, your content? Are they using a mobile device or are they using desktop? Because if they're using a mobile device, you might want to have a different experience than if they're using a desktop. That's excellent. Those are really great. So would what would you advise um, around if you had to recommend uh, the, the, the top goals that they should be thinking about in the sense of, uh, you know, part of this is understanding what this tool will enable and some of this is the contextualization of just like um, how how they would implement it for uh, you know themselves. But what I'm interested in is I love that you 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 focus on event based goals. I too really favor event based goals. Um, but can you go a little deeper on the importance of setting goals and uh, maybe one or two of the most important goals that a small business could set. Um, mm -hmm. To, to give them a place of like, it's great to give the go look at content location and accessibility, but now it's kind of like, what what are the most important kind of goals and events that should be set up? Yeah, so most sites, um, they want people to contact them, right? So I would always set up an event on the contact us form. And that's generally for most sites, all there is. If you're selling products, you wanna set up goals and events based on people purchasing those products. Um, but yeah, I, I would definitely say, I like event-based goals on form submissions almost all the time. Um, and that's really important because then you can see how well people are converting through your website. Your website is really like a big salesman for your company. And if you can get it to convert just a little bit better every week, you're going to make a lot more money in, at the end of the year. So I think forms is really what you want to put it on. And then also maybe like uh, if you have a click to call button, um, that could be beneficial. Or if you have a click to email button, um, because that's going to take them to an interface that might be off of your site that you can't track. Mm, those are excellent, excellent suggestions. That's great. Um, do we have any uh, questions coming from the audience that uh, would be worth uh, taking a peek at? Um, I've texted a few folks who might know on the call. Uh, if you guys look at your chat and your, uh, you had a question, please let me know. One of the biggest issues that we've been facing uh, is uh, tracking. Um, and it's essential to marketing. So let me just give a quick kind of marketing analytics 101. 
So the number one thing that you want to know as a small business is what is your customer acquisition cost? In other words, how much does it cost you to get a new customer? And then you compare that to what's known as the customer's lifetime value. And as long as the customer acquisition cost is less than the customer's lifetime value, you're in good shape. You're a profitable marketing department and you're a profitable business. So the customer's lifetime value is how much they're gonna spend with you over the course of their lifetime with you on average. And lifetime value is based on persona, right? So if you're, let's say a company that has a B2B arm and a B2C arm and you serve just one type of customer in each one, the lifetime value of your B2C customer will be much larger than the lifetime value most likely of your B2B customer, uh, your, of your B2C customer. So your B2B customer will have a larger lifetime value than your B2C customer. So that's the lifetime value. And then the customer acquisition cost is how much does it cost to turn that prospect into a customer. And generally speaking, B2B uh, customer acquisition costs are higher and the sales cycle is longer, but their lifetime value compensates you for it. In order to calculate the customer acquisition cost, you have to understand how each channel is contributing to that sale. Now, the modern customer journey has a lot of touches, right? It starts with an ad or a social media post. That's how they learn about you for the first time. But very rarely does it end there. It usually then goes on to a Google search, a website visit, they look at your Facebook page, your LinkedIn profile. They might check you out on Instagram. They might sign up for your newsletter. They might be receiving that newsletter for a while. And then six months later, you run another ad retargeting them based on the pixel on your website and boom, they convert. And then you attribute the first touch attribution might be that ad you ran six months ago. Last touch attribution is uh, that ad you re retargeting ad you ran six months later but there's this messy middle. And that is what um, really bedevils a lot of small business marketers is really having an accurate understanding of what's working and what's not in your marketing. So a lot of the companies that we train get started with Facebook advertising, because frankly, we think it's the best place to start. But oftentimes, more than half of the conversions of the sales they get are people that learned about them through the ad and then contacted them through the website. So Ben, I wanted to just hear you riff a little bit on this challenge, this challenge that a lot of our businesses have around how do you know what's working and what's not in our digital marketing? Well, thankfully with digital, you can track it a little bit better than like a billboard or a commercial. Uh, but yeah, it, it's having a good attribution model is what I think is uh, important. Like I showed you that multi-funnel attribution slide and understanding where the touch points are, I think is what's super important. Now, a lot of conversions might only take two or three touches, but some might take 40 or 50. Um, so really just understanding that, taking that data and looking at it and actually spending the time to know which touch points are the most um, efficient at converting is where you really want to invest your money. You know, where are you getting the best bang for your buck? And there's also like, when is good enough? You know what I mean? Especially with a relatively small business, with a relatively small staff, with relatively small traffic. How do you think, of, you've worked with a lot of different types of businesses. How do you think about good enough when it comes to tracking and analytics? Well, sometimes you're not going to be able to get there. Sometimes you just can't get like that one number that says I made this much money off of a campaign. So I think good enough is if you know it's making you money and it's profitable and a good idea. Now, maybe it might not tell you the number, but it can tell you how many clients you've gotten. And you can say, hey, if I got that many clients, I know I'm profitable. But I think that's just a business decision every company needs to make is find those key performance indicators, the KPIs that matter, and then track them using tools like Google Analytics. Perfect. So we have uh, three questions lined up. We have uh, Todd Billings, who um, uh, will have you go first, Todd. We have um, Carol, who will be right after that. Uh, and then we have a hand up with um, Jerome Jenkins. 
Um, and we also have a couple questions in the Q&A, which we'll address before we wrap up. Todd, welcome. Todd runs, among other things, a bakery. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. Great to be on and a wonderful, quick and concise uh, presentation. Um, you know, my, my question <laughs> um, really comes back to, you know, when you're trying to um, manage all of this data, um, you know, you, you seem to have such a great handle on it. Um, it, it, it seems, I, I find it a little, um, you know, challenging because there's, you know, a lot of different sources of data. So, you know, we use click funnels and we use um, type form and, and obviously we have, there's Google ads and then analytics. And, you know, I've seen some great setups with like data studio, um, I guess I, my question ultimately is like, how can we get set up to where um, we can start to really, you know, understand at least kind of a minimum viable um, product of, of analytics? Because, <clears throat> you know, in each platform, there's kind of like the goal, like in ads, I look, I track conversions and cost per conversions and things like that. In analytics, I've never really been able to um, understand um, all of the tools and features. And so uh, obviously there's a ton of education and tools you gave there. Um, do you also offer like a done for you kind of setup service or anything along those lines that could help someone who wants to fast track um, yeah. some of this? Yeah, so you can email me. Um, my email is at the bottom of the presentation, ben at sigbrand.com. And then I can help you out with something like that. Uh, what I think is important for what you're saying is, um, Multiple tools, a lot of data everywhere. How can you get that data in one spot to make a business decision? Yeah. So I think, um, like tools like Power BI, Google Data okay. Studio, those types of tools, I think, is how you can take in different sources of data, put it into one database, and then visualize it quickly to um, make good decisions. But I think it's a very common problem. And a lot of times you're busy just looking at the numbers instead of doing what you should be doing based off of the numbers. Um, so I yeah. think this data visualization is super important. And those are the best tools out there I know of to do that. Got it. Okay, great. And, and does Power BI, you know, kind of help with say, like, let's say you're doing Facebook and other platform advertising. Um, can you pull all that kind of data into one system? <laughs> Uh, you can with uh, Data Studio for sure. Power BI okay. is a Microsoft product, so I'm sure they okay. have an integration with Facebook. Yeah, Power BI is expensive. Data Studio is free. Got it. Okay, great. Um, Carol, Carol Howard, welcome. Uh, experienced marketer who also helps with her husband's uh, practice. Uh, hi, thank you. Actually, I have two questions. Great. One of, one of them is how do you figure out what, from a KPI point of view, what's the, the goal for of visitors or, you know, how, where do you get that? And the second part is actually from the course where I had a huge difference between what Facebook Pixel was telling me of people coming to the website versus what Google Analytics was saying. So, I, you know, it's, this is great timing because I've been curious about that and not sure how to figure it out. What's the right number? Okay, um, so I'll answer your second question first. Uh, so I would use the Chrome extension tool I threw in at the lightning round. It'll show you if your pixel is uh, inserted correctly. Um, now you're not like, I've never seen it one-to-one -one, like Facebook or even Google ads compared to analytics. So I wouldn't be too upset if it's a little bit off. But like if you're seeing double or triple or something, um, you might have the tracking code on there twice. Uh, that happens a lot. People will stick the code on there twice and then they have double the amount of hits or something. Ah, uh, uh, okay. <laughs> and then, and then uh, the, the data point, what do you track the KPIs question is, um, <clears throat> so I would track the data point on the website that is closest to the conversion. So if that's filling out a form, that's great. If that's buying a product, that's great. But that's where I would make my KPI and what I would track is, as far down that funnel as I can get somebody and then track that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect, um, so we had a, a Q&A uh, from Raheem Amer uh, or Amer. Uh, how do you remove your site managers going to the website and accidentally being tracked mm -hmm. as customers? So I would set up, um, you can set up a filter that blocks the IP address of their computer. Perfect. Um, and we had a question uh, from, oh, let's see. Someone had raised their hand, but I don't see them here now. 
Uh, okay. Anybody else uh, have a question for us before we get going? Um, we'll give you guys uh, Ben's contact info in the follow-up email. Um, and uh, Ben, really appreciate uh, your time, your expertise. Uh, you haven't talked about the Scorpion Company. I'm going to yeah. make you though. Uh, so just give give us give us a little tidbit about that. I'd love to hear a little bit more about that company and how. Uh, I know it's not a big part of your day to day, but I, I think it's just super interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it's called Scorpion Sweepers. Um, we use pesticide free scorpion control. So we use ultraviolet lights and we catch them with tweezers and take them off your property. So we'll catch like 50 or 100 yards at a time. Um, and then if you want to learn more about us, we're going to be on the upcoming season of Dirty Jobs. So whenever that comes out, uh, look for a scorpion episode and that's my company. I love it. And how did you get involved in removing scorpions uh, in a uh, humane way using tweezers? Yeah, so we did. I have a biology degree from Arizona State University. So I did it in the lab I interned in um, to, uh, yeah, we would sell them to ortho to test um, on for pesticides. Um, so I just said I could do this instead of selling them to a pest control com a pesticide company. I'll make a pest control company out of it. That's great. Well, you're a, a multi talented, uh, a, you know, uh, business owner and entrepreneur. And, you know, I really salute you. Um, you know, one other thing I'll say about Ben before uh, we wrap up is um, Ben uh, reached out to us as he's reached out to many AMAs um, in a really smart, systematic way that um, allows him to, how many of these talks have you done now around the country? Probably like 25 or 26. Yeah. So I, I just wanted to acknowledge your um, ingenuity and, and salute your you know, stick to itness. You made it really easy for us to to put to the, today's session on. Uh, you gave a, a lot of value in a short amount of time, and uh, really appreciate you. and um, And uh, you know, we look forward to to continuing the relationship and having you back uh, in another capacity soon. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So um, I just wanted to let you know we are almost at the end of this season of BizHack Live. Uh, we have three Fortune 500 marketing techniques for small businesses uh, from Jessica Velletri of Track Data. Uh, this is uh, a great marketing analytics section. So it's a kind of natural pairing to Google Analytics. Google Analytics is really making sure that you have a good handle on your website and how people are getting to your website um, and, uh, and whether they're converting. Uh, and this is kind of taking that to the next level and, and really leveraging data that the Fortune 500 companies are using to market themselves, but uh, bringing it down to the small business level. It will uh, blow your minds a little bit. It will hopefully inspire you. Um, and we really look forward to wrapping up this season three, uh, session 56 of BizHack Live, uh, our weekly series uh, in digital marketing for small businesses. Um, I did want to encourage you, if you haven't yet, um, please fill out this survey and let us know. It, it'll take you five minutes how we can serve you and how we can do better. Um, we're very excited uh, about uh, the beginning of planning for season four. Um, things have changed a lot. Uh, there's a lot of Zoom fatigue. Um, small businesses, are, are many of them are back in business. Uh, the challenges remain. Uh, we, uh, if, if you didn't need proof, we live in a digital world and BizHack is here to help you adapt to that digital world and to make the process of growing simpler. Uh, and we want your help in shaping how we provide that service to you. And as a thank you, one of you will get a great uh, gift card. We're going to be closing the survey next week. So please don't wait to fill it out. And please uh, join us, follow us. Uh, this recording will be on our YouTube channel. Uh, we are active on social media, on Instagram, Facebook, uh, LinkedIn. And with that, thank you so much for coming today. And we'll see you next week uh, for BizHack Live.